I'll be discussing what Fiji does. But first, I'd like to start by talking about um, some <coughs> historic cases I've come across in researching a book that we're going to be publishing next year. And I think they will help me make a point about how jury nullification is relevant at specifically a drug policy conference. So let's start with this excellent article from the New York Times from 1928. This article refers to the trial of George Bevin, a defendant who was um, brought up on an alcohol violation. His jurors were hauled in before the judge so that he could scold them and uh, uh, give them a talking to for their very diligent methodology during deliberation. Uh, this methodology, involved um, investigating the facts they were provided um, with the evidence in the case. And from the New York Times article, quote, the jurors all admitted drinking the pint of liquor, which was the prosecution's chief exhibit against the <laughs> All denied it was consumed without an honorable motive. <laughs> they stated it was sampled to determine whether it was of alcoholic content and actually constituted a violation of the liquor law, end quote. Subsequently, after they realized they had no evidence against the, the defendant, they realized they were forced to acquit. He was not guilty. I love this jury. This jury gave the prohibition laws exactly the amount of respect they were due, and that is none at all. And we see a lot of we see a lot of comparisons between alcohol prohibition and the drug war that I'm going to talk about briefly. Alcohol prohibition was passed through a rigorous constitutional amendment process, but the war on drugs was much more easily instituted by presidential edict and statutory law. Alcohol prohibition, like the drug war, was a huge failure, but it was repealed in just over 13 years, whereas we've had 40 plus years of the destructive war on drugs. The court system was heavily clogged with alcohol violation cases, and prosecutors leaned heavily on the plea bargain to clear the system. They were relatively very generous with those pleas. On the other hand, now 90% of felonies, many of which are drug cases, never even get to a jury trial. And that is because prosecutors are very maliciously stacking charges. We're seeing mandatory minimums. We're seeing drug courts and other elements that are tilting the playing field bullying defendants into foregoing their right to trial by jury and taking a plea bargain. And those plea bargains are, of course, much harsher than they would have been during prohibition. We're also seeing a two-tiered system in our society, just as we did during prohibition. Uh, back then, uh, prominent members of the community, often government officials, would have their own private entrances to speak easy so that they could violate the law in the privacy and comfort that they desired. Uh, in, the, in the current situation, we actually have adults alive today who have never had a president who hasn't violated a drug law. Yet none of these presidents have ever been prosecuted uh, under the laws that are typically used to ruin other people's lives, and especially used very harshly against low-income individuals and people of color. And as a panel that is not notably diverse by outward appearances, I think we would be shamefully remiss if we didn't acknowledge the egregiously disproportionate use of the drug war to damage communities of color. And with that, let's go back a little bit further to 1850 um, during slavery in the United States. Um, on the left, you see a graphic, um, which I think Steve in particular will appreciate. These were the first, uh, were early flex your rightsers. <laughs> they are, uh, Specifically, this is a flyer from Boston in um, April of 1851, urging people not to talk to the police and indeed to shun the police. Uh, this was a couple of months after um, a an alleged fugitive was captured being Shadrach Minkins, which led to a series of, of cases called the Shadrach Rescue Cases. The individuals who helped this person escape to Canada were prosecuted under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was a key part of the Compromise of 1850, which was a set of federal laws crafted to keep the Union together with a tenuous balance between free and slave states, and it imposed upon people in free states numerous objectionable pr provisions, including that private citizens would be obligated legally to assist in the capture of 
people who are alleged to be fugitive slaves, and that those, fugitive, those alleged fugitives would not have a trial by jury, instead they would have a trial by commission. Often those commissioners would get paid twice as much to, if they agreed to return the individual to slavery, rather than if they, if they had quit it. And in fact, they could be returned to slavery, or even in fact sent to slavery, a free person, simply on the claim of the individual that they said that they owned this person. Uh, the second set, uh, oh, the, I should also mention, the Shadrach rescue cases were very notable because the government was going to use them as an example of how they were going to be able to make this compromise work. And they prosecuted them in the order in which they thought they would be most successful in getting prosecutions. After seven, the first seven consecutive trials, they gave up because they couldn't get a single conviction of any defendant, black or white. People of Boston protected their neighbors and did the right thing, ignoring the law in the process. The other two um, items on this slide are from the Jerry Rescue cases. These were a similar set of cases for the rescue of a fugitive and um, helping him escape to Canada from New York. In this set of cases, we saw 26 trials with a single prosecution, which would likely have been overturned on appeal had the defendant not passed away in the process. And this was, this was a huge embarrassment for the government and in fact ruined political careers over this. And again, we can see some very notable comparisons between slavery and <coughs> Jim Crow era and drug prohibition now. Under slavery, blacks had no legal recourse at all. No rights, no legal recourse. Now, it's obviously not like that now, but we are kind of going back in that direction when we see Fourth Amendment protection circumvented for so-called public safety reasons. Blacks had no political participation, including serving as jurors or testifying on their own behalf under slavery. And even after slavery, poll taxes rigged so-called literacy tests and other things were used as preconditions to allow them into the system, thereby continuously keeping them disenfranchised. Now, instead of that, we see felony convictions which um, result in loss of voting rights, loss of, resulting in loss of jury participation, and so on. Again, disenfranchising people from the political process. Forced labor was the rule under slavery, but even after slavery, vagrancy laws mandated labor even for people who had previously been freed. And if one was convicted for a so-called vagrancy violation, states could hire out the prisoners for no pay, um, creating a condition of quasi-slavery. Well, the 13th Amendment left an opening for that by making an exception for involuntary servitude in the case of punishment for crime. And what do we see now? We see victims of the drug war being used as cheap labor in private prisons or being contracted out. And often they'll get paid something in the neighborhood of like 19 cents an hour. Um, under slavery, explicit racism was the law with separate penalties for whites and non-whites. Now, we still, have slavery, we still have racism in the system, but it's more implicit. And we kind of hide it under the fact that the so-called laws apply to everyone. However, they are not enforced equally and we can see that very measurably in racial disparities for arrests, convictions, sentencing, and e this is true even when corrected for factors such as frequency and severity of, of offenses. So what is going on here? We have spoken up repeatedly against both prohibition and slavery, but the war on drugs is insidiously being used to circumvent both of those statements made by the people. And in your packet, you'll find a little uh, container of sweet tarts, which just shows the level of maliciousness we've gone to. People are being prosecuted for less than the amount of, of drugs than, than you have in the, the sweet, sweet tart packet. So, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, and I'd also like to mention, I'd like to reframe here something that Clay said. He referred to jury nullification as disingenuous fact-finding. And I'd like to suggest an alternative framing. I consider it a genuine finding that the law is, as applied in the case at hand is wrong, and I believe the true disingenuousness of the system is from laws that redefine vices which harm nobody as crimes. Crimes are actually things that harm people or property. And further disingenuousness, we, come, we, we saw from Tim's talk, in judges 
um, explicitly misinforming jurors of their rights. So with all of these parallels um, in these two situations, there is a notable missing parallel. Mass jury nullification undermined the Fugitive Slave Act and the Compromise of 1850, contributing to bringing emancipation. Mass jury nullification made a laughing stock of prohibition, but we're not seeing those things now. Jury nullification really should be a tool that we use to provide relief from the war on drugs and to protect all of our rights. And the fact that we're not makes me a little nuts. <laughs> I, I feel like that picture, it, I, I, it, it boggles my mind. Why do you think it's not being used? Uh, uh, we'll get to questions later. <laughs> um, but um, it is indeed a tool for policy change. And we can see that because two constitutional amendments were helped along to their, to their final passage through jury nullification. And in fact, the highest and best purpose of the independent jury is to protect each other from these unjust laws and abusive prosecutions imposed by government. And to quote two notable um, Americans, let's, let's, I agree with Nancy Reagan, let's just say no to these laws. And I also agree with Barack Obama that we can't wait. It's been 40 years, it's been far too long. Now, we saw earlier there are a number of lawyers in the room, but in fact, all of us are gonna have a hard time getting on juries, not just the lawyers. So it's not enough to simply hear this information and keep it to ourselves. We are, we are um, only called for jury duty once or twice in our lives, typically. And um, if we want to have informed jurors, we need to take this information back to our communities. And so that brings us to Fiji's mission, which is to educate everyone regarding their full power as jurors, including the ability to rely on personal conscience and to judge the merit of the law and its application and when necessary for justice to nullify bad laws. So just quickly because I get a lot of calls saying, you know, can you, you know, you have the word jury in your name, you know, can you do this legal thing for me? I want to clarify what we do and do not do. We are an educational outreach organization. We have 501c3 status. We are a source for credible documented information and we provide that on our website and, and through other means. And we are a primarily volunteer-driven and extraordinarily financially efficient organization. We are not staying at the conference hotel. We are staying in an Airbnb room that costs for four nights less than one night here. So we are very, very tight with our donors' dollars and appreciate that people work hard for those and that we need to spend them very wisely. What we do not do is provide legal advice or representation either to people wanting to nullify or to activists who may encounter legal issues while they're, they're doing activism. We don't advocate for or against any case in progress, nor do we endorse any candidate or piece of legislation. And we don't swoop in with money and volunteers to fix problems for you. <laughs> I often get people calling the office who have a case that uh, they are are concerned about, and but they've never done anything with jury nullification before, and they want us to come and fix their problem, and that just can't happen. We need to have an ongoing effort, and that ongoing effort includes includes uh, our website and social media where we distribute information. We also publish educational materials, some of which are in your packet. You each have, um, assuming I counted correctly, um, 12 flyers. Each of, the, each of those represents a single jury. So you have the tools to go out and create one fully informed jury or 12 hung juries. Yeah. <laughs> we also have a speakers bureau and can provide someone for you in person if someone's available locally or by Skype if you're set up for that on your end. We do media outreach, um, including granting interviews and reviewing scripts and supplying information and prop kits to movie and television producers. And in fact, one of our calendars, I, I think, was featured on, I, I can't remember which of the crime dramas, but uh, we actually we actually had that in prime time. Uh, we have the Fiji Infor Information Line, where anyone can call us and leave their name and address. We will send them a jury power information kit. That is 1-800-T-E-L-J-U-R-Y. We are very active in communities doing sidewalk activism, near courthouses, downtown, public transit stations, and so on. Um, hosting information events, hemp fests are a very popular place for these tables. 
among others. Um, we work with student groups. And here you see a few of our pictures. Um, we have Ed Fortune there on the left with the No Victim, No Crime uh, banner. We have a uh, county fair in Montana with our Fiji banner there. In the middle, we have uh, someone from a Jury Rights Day event this year handing out literature. The fourth picture is in front of the Hall of Justice in San Diego, where that week, uh, you can see them reading our literature, and that week there were two cases that um, were likely nullifications. And there on the right, someone from our Florida campaign. Jury Rights Day is September 5th each year, commemorating the uh, trial of William Penn. And uh, here are some things from, from our previous Jury Rights Day celebrations. This year we had 26 events across the country and we'd be happy to help you do that next year. We also have local campaigns, um, sometimes organized by us, sometimes organized by local activists or with other groups. And here on the right you see um, an ad. Fiji doesn't place ads, but people can raise money to place ads on our behalf. That is currently in the Judiciary Square uh, metro station in Washington, D.C. <coughs> um, we also have a program called Lunch Break for Liberty. I'd like to invite you to join me at lunch on Saturday, meet at the Fiji table at the beginning of the lunch break. Bring your 12 flyers. We'll go up and down to canvassing in 16th Street Mall. Uh, why not do Denver a favor while we're here? We have a huge force, right? <laughs> um, so we'll meet at the table. I'll give a little introduction to how we do it, and then we'll go walk down, hand out literature, and anyone can grab lunch when they want it. Um, so the last question is, well, you know, what can I do? Well. Aside from understanding your role and, and acting as a juror, you can engage in juror education in your community. And you can also help us continue our work with your volunteer efforts and contributions. What is at stake is huge. You can save reputations, you can save relationships, you can save people's livelihood or property, you can save their educations because they may not be able to get a student loan if convicted, you can save their freedom, and you can, in fact, save their life. I mean, even if they weren't, even if it wasn't a death penalty case, people do get killed in prison. You cannot be required to check your conscience at the courthouse door. No victim means there is no crime. There is a difference between a vice and a crime. A crime involves harming a person or property, and if there is no victim, then the law is what is wrong, not the person. The person is, themselves is not guilty. So thank you very much.